Would you pray with me? God, we praise you that you are such a good, good father. You are better than even the best of earthly fathers. God, your love for us is so perfect. It's unending. It meets us in our greatest place of need, and it doesn't leave us there. No, it helps us through. God, we thank you that you see us through the good times and through the difficult times. We thank you that you always love us on our best days and our worst days. God, I pray that you would help us to communicate that love that you have for us, to communicate that same kind of love to the world around us. Lord, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, friends. I want to welcome you to Stillwater Church this morning. My name's John. I'm one of the pastors here. Especially want to welcome those of you who are back from, for your uh, second time after Easter last weekend was your first. We're so glad that you chose to join us uh, once again for worship. Hey, uh, church family, you did an awesome job last weekend. We challenged you to invite your friends, to be hospitable, all that kind of stuff. Uh, across our two campuses, we had well over 1,000 people last weekend. And that's awesome. So way to go. Way to go, church family. Folks come because you invite them, and I'm so thankful that you continue to do so. So hey, we're launching into an exciting new message series this weekend, and we're going to look at uh, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and it starts off with seven letters to seven different churches. Now these were actual churches uh, back in those days. Uh, they were churches, uh, probably not just a single church building, but they were a community of churches in each of these cities. So what's happening here in the book of Revelation is you've got John. John is the disciple. Uh, we talked about him last week, right? The guy who called himself the disciple who Jesus loved. Uh, John is the last living disciple at this point, okay? All of John's peers have been martyred. They've been killed for their faith. John, well, they attempted to kill him by boiling him in oil, but he didn't die. And so they exiled him to Patmos. So you imagine what he would look like with these burns on his body. You imagine what his heart must feel like as he's the, the lone survivor of this group of apostles that, that Jesus had, or disciples that Jesus had walking with him. He's seen a lot. He's done a lot. The, the gospel is, has spread throughout the known world. The kingdom has grown radically, and yet there's serious persecution. The, the church is threatened uh, by evil Roman emperors who are persecuting Christians just simply because of the fact they're Christians. So John is exiled to this Isle of Patmos. It was, uh, was kind of like a, a prison of sorts. You're not, you can't leave. It was a several hour boat ride in those days. There's no swimming back to the mainland. So John is going to live out his days in, in a form of captivity here. So John is on, on the island. And there Jesus meets him in a vision. Imagine that. It's been decades since he's seen Jesus. He did life with him. He walked with him in, the, in his earlier, younger days. Since that time, John has courageously spread the gospel. He's suffered. He's grown in his boldness and his courage and all of this. And then Jesus meets this old man again here on this aisle. And he gives him this, this great vision and this vision is not just for John, though. This vision is for the church. And John is told repeatedly to write down these things that he sees. Now, some of Revelation is, is pretty challenging because it uses a lot of, of imagery, okay? And imagery does not tell us exactly what the truth is. Imagery points us to the truth. So there's some things that are illustrations. That, and to understand those... Uh, there's, there's a variety of ways that people interpret this book. Sometimes folks interpret it as if these images are kind of like hidden magical things that, will make, that made no sense to John and would make no sense to any church until that one church that's like at the very end of times. Okay? And I don't think that's really a very good interpretation. Okay? Because that means that this book has been virtually useless to pretty much everybody, and nobody will really know that it's useful to them until, well, Jesus has returned, and then it's a little late at that point. You see, th this was written to John in a way that he would have understood, that the people around him would have understood. Because as first century Jews, they had a, a whole pool of images available uh, at their disposal, just like we have 
as, as Americans living in this world. If we say certain things, if we refer to certain things, we have images that pop up into our brains. And so, so we know what these things mean because it's just kind of common knowledge. You could talk about a brand name. You could talk about a sports team. You could talk about a country or you could talk about a TV show. And we all kind of have some common knowledge. Jews had that same kind of thing, no, no different than us. And so as we interpret this book, we want to look at some of the imagery as they would have seen it back in their day, because that helps us understand what it means for us today, okay? Uh, there's seven churches that John writes to, and you're going to basically have two of them that we'd say are doing well. There's kind of two good, uh, there's two that are bad, and three that are kind of ugly, okay? We've got the good, the bad, the ugly churches here, and today we're going to look at one of the ugly ones. They're not bad, but they're not really good either. Okay, they've got some problems. Our worship team did an excellent job this morning of leading us in some songs that talk about God's love. And they, they selected these because this church is a church that's kind of all head and, and no heart. They, they've got their beliefs right. They've got some things solid. But they've lost that, that love, that, that, that passion for the world around them in the same way that one, they that once had. So Jesus is going to challenge them. We're going to look at the first letter, which is to the church in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was a big, big deal. It was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. Okay? It was huge. Roughly half a million people lived there. Uh, they have excavated, uh, that means they, they've dug up a lot of Ephesus, uh, although really probably only about 15% of it has been dug up at this point. So there's a whole lot more uh, to be discovered at this place. But what they've, been, they've dug up has been incredible so far. In fact, we've got a picture here. This is their main street. Uh, it was made of marble, okay? And look at how wide that thing is. And those columns, imagine what it would have looked like back in, in its day when, when it was all put together. This was kind of a main street. Uh, you'd have a marketplace there. This is where the commerce all happened. And marble streets, I mean, that would be extreme in today's world, right? We just use blacktop or concrete, okay? So it's a church, or a, a city... Uh, with a lot of wealth. This, this road here is kind of like your uh, magnificent mile of their day, if you will, right? Picture Chicago here. Uh, it's kind of like their version of that, okay? Uh, so that it was a, a big, influential, significant city there. Um, now, they, uh, they had a variety of things we'll look at here. One of the things they had was uh, they had an altar to the goddess uh, Nicaea. Nicaea, we have an image of her here. Uh, Nicaea is the goddess of victory. Nicaea's uh, name is spelled in a way that's more familiar to us. It's N-I-K-E. We would call her Nike, right? And actually, archaeologists found another version of her. There may be some trademark infringement. We're not sure. But this is where, the where we get the brand Nike from, okay? Goddess of victory. She was worshipped there. She wasn't the only goddess to be worshipped there. We'll talk about some others here in a bit. But John starts off his letter, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, says this. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And I'd be like, oh, great, we just started the letter. It already doesn't make sense. What is he talking about here? What, what does all of this mean? Well, each letter, it starts off with an introduction of Jesus, okay? That's why, because Jesus is the author of these letters. If you were reading this in your Bible and you have a red letter edition, these, these uh, letters will be written in red text in your Bible because they're, they're letters from Jesus. So he's introducing himself, okay? And in each introduction, we'll see, he introduces himself in a way that's relevant to the church that he is writing, okay? And so he starts off, he says, this is the message from the one that's Jesus, who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Okay, so seven stars, the, the previous chapter has kind of given us some information on it, and it's basically a reference to the seven churches. So he's saying, I hold these seven churches in my hand, okay? I love you, I care about you, I'm Lord over the church still, I'm Jesus Christ, okay? That's, he's identifying himself. There's also a little dab, or jab, excuse me, at uh, Dominician, who was the uh, Roman emperor at the time, uh, because he was a guy who thought very, very highly of himself. In fact, Roman emperors would sometimes be worshipped as gods after their death, but this guy took it to a whole new level. He demanded to be worshipped as a god while he was alive. 
In fact, he had coins made of himself. We've got an image of this here. And you see on this one, he looks kind of silly on the right, but he's holding seven stars and sitting on top of the world, okay? <laughs> if you thought any of our leaders today were arrogant, they could take a page from this guy, right? Because he's kind of the ultimate example, right? Imagine if he had a Twitter account, right? I mean, oh my gosh, that would be amazing. So here's this guy who thinks that he holds the world and the stars in his hand, and Jesus is kind of jabbing him a little bit. He's saying, you know, I'm the real king. I'm the real Lord of this universe. It's not your little Roman leader there. No, it's, it's me. I'm the one who holds the seven stars. And these seven stars, they're the seven churches. Uh, and so then he talks about the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Again, referencing back to the last chapter, he talked about these churches. And this refers back to Jesus' words way back when, when he, he compared the church to one who's like a city on a hill. Remember, and he said, don't hide your light, right? You want to have your light shining for all the world to see. It's a metaphor for the church. We're supposed to be a lampstand because we're not the light, right? Jesus is the light. We're just the stand on which the light sits so that the rest of the world can see it. So we've got to make sure that we don't get too full of ourselves because, again, it's not about us. We're not here for still water. We're here for Jesus. And a church at its best is simply a lampstand on which the, the light of the good news sits so it can be seen by all the world around, okay? So he's saying, write this message. Uh, you know, it's from the one here who holds these seven churches, who walks among these seven churches, okay? So you've got these. Uh, this is kind of a reference back to in, in Judaism. You've got a uh, menorah here. These were found, this was found uh, in the temple. Uh, you've got the golden lampstand, uh, symbolic, a very powerful symbol of Judaism. And so it's, it's really making a reference here to show the continuity that the church is, has really replaced the, uh, Judaism, right? Uh, the church is the true temple. Jesus himself, the true temple. Jesus himself, the true sacrifice. Jesus himself has replaced that system. And so now the church is this lampstand. It's our job to shine the light of Jesus here in the world. Verse 2, he says, I know all the things you do. I've seen all your hard work and patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. And this was a strong, strong compliment to the Ephesians. Because you see, they lived in a city where it was not easy to be a follower of Jesus. There was all sorts of distractions, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of just evil around. It was not an easy place to raise a family, not an easy place uh, to kind of be on the straight and narrow. I mean, for one, you've got the emperor who's worshipped as a god, and if you don't worship him, you could be put to death, okay? Uh, then there was just a lot of uh, immorality as well. In Ephesus, it was one of the areas in the Roman Empire where prostitution was legalized. In fact, they had a brothel in their town. And, and this uh, it is especially interesting because they had the brothel, and across the street they would build a library. And then under the street they would make a tunnel from the library to the brothel, which is creative, right? Because you don't know if your guy's going to study or to study, right? Because you can take the tunnel. So it's a city of kind of no shame in certain ways. It's a city where it's not the easiest thing to be a follower of Jesus. And it's important for us to understand that, that they're standing strong in a town where it's not easy to stand strong. And it's not the job of the church to just affirm all the evil around us, right? They stood strong against the evil. They didn't participate in all of this stuff. And Jesus is uh, he's affirming them in this. And it's a good word for us to hear. Because sometimes we can be so just kind of compliant with all the evil around us and say, well, I'm not, I'm not here to judge, right? Well, of course, we're not here to send people to hell and decide these kind of eternal things. But we certainly are people who should not be just tolerating evil right in our midst, in our, especially in our own lives, okay? And this is something this church does really well. He continues, verse 2, he says, You've examined the claims of those who say they're apostles but are not. You've discovered they're liars. You've patiently suffered for me without quitting. Okay, so, so far, so good. Because, again, this is, this is in the early days where you don't even have the Bible all assembled, right? 
the Bible has been kind of uh, written little by little, book by book. And so it was a difficult time for false teaching. Lots of people were coming and misrepresenting Jesus' words. And he says, you've sorted out those things. That's great. Uh, you're doing well there. You're patiently endured without suffering. Again, in a very difficult area. The book of Acts has shed a little bit of light on this. Uh, way back uh, in Acts chapter 18, uh, the Christian movement had grown so successfully in Ephesus that it was actually hurting the local economy, okay? And people were getting upset because Christianity was succeeding so well. See, they had this temple of Artemis. We've got a model of it here, and it's amazing. Can you imagine that thing? I mean, they, they've uh, dug up parts of it, and they found that these columns, they were eight feet around, marble columns, eight feet around. These things were 67 feet high, and there was 127 of them. Okay, just get a visual of that, 67 feet tall. I mean, this would be amazing in our day with our technology and our machines. How they did in those days, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it was right there in Ephesus. So it was a major tourist attraction. People would come in and they would, and this, they would buy these little metal images of Artemis, these little, this goddess. They would buy these small idols to take home with them. And so the, the, Christ, the Christians had been so effective that, that they found that the, uh, the uh, uh, industry was not supporting the sale of these idols nearly like it was before. Sales had dropped dramatically of idols because we're saying we don't need these anymore. These are not gods. Jesus is God. He's the one true God. You don't need to go buy thing, uh, idols of, of gold or stone or metal or any of these kind of things. You worship a true God, not this false stuff. And so they're in Ephesus. In fact, it got so bad uh, that, that they uh, kind of, they started to have almost a mini riot. Uh, the people came into this big amphitheater, which we've dug that up. It's uh, it sat 24,000 people. <laughs> I mean, see this one little guy down there, right? That's a normal sized adult, right? I mean, 24,000 people in here and they all gathered in here and they spent, the Bible tells us, two hours yelling, yelling for Artemis. Two solid hours they yelled, uh, and they said, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. It's kind of a, like a pep rally here, right? Saying, you know, Jesus has taken away too much of our business here. We need to, to strengthen our loyalty to Artemis. And the local magistrates, they had to disband this thing because, because people were, they were worried that a riot was going to break out. So that's how effective this church was. They were so impactful in the community that they were actually changing the economy for the better. So, the, in fact, uh, there was healing happening. Other stories in Acts show where there were pagans who were trying to imitate Christian healing. They were trying to use Jesus' name because they saw what Jesus was doing, okay? Of course, that didn't work out too well. Uh, but they were, so you're seeing miracles. You're seeing the economy change. You're seeing them stand strong in the face of problems. If you're this church right now, you're saying, we're doing pretty darn good, you know? I mean, if this is Jesus' like annual review of this church, I'd say it's pretty solid. We've got a lot to pat ourselves on the back about. Things are going really, really well. Verse 4, but, you knew there was going to be a but, right? Because I told you it was kind of ugly. I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. You know, compared to everything else, you might say, okay, you know, a lot of positives, one negatives, we'll take it, right? But not so much because this is a big, big deal. Remember, uh, our faith in God is about two simple things, loving God and loving others. If you want to boil it all down, it really comes down to those two foundational things, simple to understand, hard to practice. Loving God, loving others. And he says, you know, you're doing well with all this stuff. You've got the right beliefs. You're standing against evil. You're impacting the local world around you. All this kind of good stuff. But the one thing, oh, it's the main thing. You forgot about love. You've, you, you don't love me, Jesus, or each other as you did at first. He wasn't critiquing their diligence, their faithfulness, their, their service. These are people who working, or they're working hard, 
They were probably volunteering in their church. They're probably giving of their time, their talents, their resources. They're, they're certainly spreading the good news. They're doing so many things, but he's saying, look, you're just not very loving anymore. Something's happened in here to where this has transitioned from being an act of love to simply a cognitive thing. We're the strong church in Ephesus. We know what we're doing. We're successful. And we're not sure that we love you guys anymore. Because we're strong. Not what Jesus had called them to be. He says, I know your heart. It's, it's gotten a little calloused. A little less caring. It's not what it once was. When you started, there was love for each other. There was love for Jesus. That's, was, that was the motor that spread this thing. And now it's become a set of beliefs that are up here, but they're just not making that long 18-inch journey to here. It's just not happening. It's not happening. Verse 5, look at how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its places among the churches. This is hardcore. This is hardcore. Jesus is... (laughs) Jesus is very Wesley in here, if you will. See, as followers of John Wesley, we believe that salvation is a free gift that we receive when we choose to ask Jesus into our heart. We don't believe that Jesus, like, predestined us, right? That we had no choice, that Jesus' sacrifice was for an elite select group of people, and lucky you and me were part of it. No, we don't believe, we reject that. We say no that Jesus died for the whole world. Not just a select group of people. He died for everybody. Everybody in this world has the opportunity to follow Jesus, and everybody in this world has the opportunity to reject Jesus. And when you ask Jesus into your life, it's not that you have then given up your free will. You always have free will as a human being, okay? And he's saying, look, if you continue... If you continue to exercise your free will in a way that is not loving to me, Jesus, or to the world around you, I'm turning out the lights. I- I'm shutting this down. You, you, got, you, you guys do not continue anymore as a church. You're not continuing anymore in your faith because you're missing the whole point. You're missing everything. If you don't, This is not like a checklist of 10 things. You missed one, you get a 90. No, this is one. You miss this, you get zero. If you don't have love, you have nothing. You have nothing, friends. I'll come, I'll take away your lampstand, he says. Look, we're not saved by our good deeds. Hear me, we're not saved because we work our way into heaven. God only knows that you and me could not do that. We're saved only by the grace of God, the free gift of Jesus Christ. He's not saying that you work your way into a relationship with God. But the thing is, If you have a real relationship, that's going to cause good deeds. It's going to cause good works. James tells us that faith without works is dead. Okay? Because if you love God, if you love others, that has to result in works. You know, and sometimes people get, they get a little bit hung up over this distinction, but I think, I don't think it's tough to understand, just if you think of it in kind of a a human relationship. Uh, I'm not... I'm not married because I treat my wife well, right? That's not, that's not why I'm married. I'm married because we made this commitment to each other. But I treat my wife well because we're married. We have this commitment. If I didn't do that, you'd say, are you actually married, right? I mean, what, what's up with this, right? I mean, what kind of spouse would say, look, we can be technically married and not treat one another well, right? We made this commitment way back when, so... Who cares how we treat each other? Well, you may be still technically married, but also technically in the doghouse, right? Because it doesn't work that way. It's a relationship of love. It's a relationship of love in the same way with Jesus, okay? It's we, we, we do good things. We love as a result of our faith, as a result of a real life changing relationship with Jesus. How many of us, no, no show of hands here, but if we were honest, let's look back at our Christian walk. Maybe it's brand new for you, so this isn't as relevant, but maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, 
and you say, you know, in my earlier days, I probably was a lot more loving. I've, I've, I've got the beliefs as well or better than I've ever had. But I just get so fed up with people. My heart's grown kind of calloused. It's grown kind of judgmental. It's, it's, well, and, and, it's, and it's hard to be a Christian in this world. Is there so many things? But, but Jesus doesn't give us that out, right? Because it was hard to be a Christian in Ephesus. In fact, one of the things about Domination was that he raised taxes dramatically. And it helped fund his building projects. But it, he also gave a massive raise to the military so that they would be helpful to him in carrying out his, his rules. One of those was the persecution of Christians. So get this, if you're a Christian, you have to pay higher taxes to pay the guys who are imprisoning, torturing, and killing your family members, friends, and maybe you someday. That, I mean, persecution's bad enough. It, doesn't, it seems like it should be a freebie, though, right? I mean, you know, you have to pay for it. I mean, I mean, this is really, really difficult. It was hard to be a follower of Jesus, much harder than what people like you and me understand, okay? And if anybody could make excuses, it should be them, but Jesus doesn't give them any excuses. Verse 6, he says uh, uh, something, uh, he says, this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Honestly, <laughs> scholars don't know who the Nicolaitans are. And there's a whole lot of debate around it, but basically they're people who were doing bad things and they were standing against it. That's kind of all we know for sure. Uh, verse 7, he, kinda, he drives it home and he says, Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. So he's saying, look, you're, you should be loving. You're not loving. Either get it right, and you'll e experience eternal life, this, this fruit of the tree of life in the paradise of God, or keep up what you're doing, and I'm going to take you out. I'm taking the lampstand, okay? I'm shutting it down. Hard words from Jesus. And I think they're still relevant to us today. It's easy to have this kind of cold orthodoxy in our, our beliefs. And, and I believe that, I, I know that our beliefs are very important. Don't get me wrong. What you believe absolutely matters. But it's not just about what is up here. That's a starting place. It's also about what's in your heart. There's several ways that you and I could end up like this church. We'll go through them kind of quick here. They're in your notes. Several ways that we want to avoid. The first would be we could be focusing on truth at the expense of love. Okay? Focusing on truth at the expense in love. I remember I had a friend in high school who was incredibly rude to people, and he'd say these incredibly rude things, and when they'd get upset, he'd say, hey, the truth hurts. That's not helpful, you know? <laughs> yes, sometimes truth does hurt, but we're called, the Bible says, to speak the truth in love. It's not either or. Not just, well, I'm speaking truth, so I'm getting it half right. No, you're getting it all wrong. Speak the truth in love. How are you doing with that? Second, forgetting the power of the Holy Spirit. This is huge. It's easy for us in that we get our beliefs right, we get our understandings right. These stories about Jesus are no longer new. We've got it. John starts a sermon. You can already tell what he's going to say by the end of it, right? Way to go. And we forget that this is life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. That these words are alive and powerful. Last night we had a musician here, Randy Stonehill. He's been writing for over 40 years. He's written over 800 songs, right? And this guy just blew me away. Because if you, those of you who are here, you saw the reality of his faith was so strong. As he was sharing his testimony, as he was sharing words between songs, then as I watched him, he stuck around for like an hour and a half after the concert to talk with people and to just tell about what Jesus is doing in his life and stuff. After 40 years, this guy could easily become kind of cold and calloused and bored. No, he's got a real love because he understands the power of the Holy Spirit working through his ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. We, we should never forget that. Otherwise, you get the emotional equivalent of a, a passionless marriage. That's what you forget. That's what you get if you forget about the power of the Holy Spirit. You get a, a commitment, uh, a truth with no feeling, 
no passion, and it's dead. Number three, viewing people with contempt instead of compassion. This is what will happen if you allow number one and number two to happen long enough in your life. It's like a cancer that grows. It may start off with focusing on truth at the expense of love. It may move then to forgetting about the power of the Holy Spirit. The three is where it becomes even more problematic, uh, where we view con- people with contempt instead of compassion. Maybe, you know, you look at other people now, and you just get so easily frustrated and angry. Every, all the stuff they do ticks you. And maybe it's just humanity in general. Maybe it's just a group of people. Maybe it's one person. I don't know. But whoever it is for you, you have no tolerance for them. You have no patience for them. You have no kindness for them. You, 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 look, at, you look at poor people and you say they're lazy. You look at single moms and say they're not disciplined. You look at uh, people who have less than you and you say they don't work hard. You look at people who have more than you and you say they're greedy. You look at all these people are God's children. We don't get to choose whether we love or not. It's not optional for us. We've got to wake up. We've got to wake up. Verse 5, look at how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I'll come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Jesus speaks those same words to us today. It's just as relevant. Love is no different for the church at Stillwater than it was the church at Ephesus. It's, we have the same responsibility, the same call to love. And number four. Feel, uh, the last one would be feeling like we've done enough in the church. Now, this happens sometimes. And sometimes it happens when we get older. Sometimes it happens at younger ages if we've been in the church long enough. We say, you know what? I've done my time. I've served. I've blah, blah, blah. I just, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to consume now because I've, I've kind of done my time. It's not really how a relationship with Jesus works. It's an always ongoing thing. I mean, you, you meet a couple who's been married 60 years. If it's a good marriage, they don't say, you know what? After about year 40, we decide we've kind of done enough for each other. We're just phoning it in from now on, right? No, <laughs> that's not it. It's not it at all. And, you know, I see so many great examples of the opposite of this thing in our church. This guy named Bill Reese, some of you know him. Bill, Bill and Hazel have been part of Stillwater for a long time, and, and health concerns now, they can't make it to church very often. But Bill emails me and others every single month, and he says, how can I pray for you this month? And you know what? He does it, too. Because every month I tell him what he can pray for. And then he checks back with me. How's this going? How's that going? Because I know that he's praying for me. And even though he can't hardly be here at all, he's praying for me. And I thank God for that. So many examples of folks who do this, who live this out so well. You know, maybe you've fallen into this standpoint a little bit. You know, and say, you know, how, God, how are you calling me to serve? One easy way, we've got our uh, mission trip coming up this summer uh, that I wanted to highlight for you. It's, remember, it's adults and teens together. And here's the deal. The teens have signed up in mass. Adults, eh, are so-so on that, okay? So we're kind of getting our butts kicked right now. And uh, there's an opportunity to go serve. Remember when the hurricane went through, we all had a lot of passion about helping. This is an opportunity to do so. Um, if you want, you want to do so, uh, talk to Michelle Lafferty. There's information in your bulletin. I'd love to have you join me as we go serve this summer. That's one way. Maybe it's not the right one for you, but whatever it is, find the right one for you. Don't fall into this belief that I've probably done enough. Because I love how Jesus ends it. Verse 7, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I'll give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. May that be what God says about us. Because you know our faith ultimately, it's not something we do for God, it's what God does for us. And as people have received so much incredible love, grace, and forgiveness from this incredibly good Heavenly Father, our natural response is to give that love back to the world. Our beliefs drive us to love. Our beliefs should make us the most loving, caring, and compassionate people out there. Would you pray with me? God, may we never be a people who forgets how to love. Forgive us for the times where we've got the beliefs right and we've got the other things right, but we lack love. Lord, we've all been there. 
We confess them to you right now. Jesus, would you forgive us? Would you heal us? Would you help us to fall more in love with you and more in love with others around us? The lost, the needy, the people at our jobs, the people in our families, our neighbors, everyone, God. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.